If you have your Bibles, please turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Uh, over the last few weeks, we've been journeying through the book, uh, Paul's first epistle to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians. Uh, we've covered the first five chapters. We're just reading through verse by verse. Uh, today, we're going to cover the sixth chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Uh, just to give a quick, a brief background to 1 Corinthians, uh, we have shared in, earlier that the Apostle Paul, on his second missionary journey, uh, he came through uh, Athens, and then from Athens, he went over into Corinth, which is about 40, 50 miles west of uh, Athens. And so in Corinth, which was a, a very busy commercial seaport town, uh, Paul spent 18 months with his team there, and they established a local church in Corinth. And um, then they moved on. They traveled on further from there. Now, about seven years later, and I, again, this is a approximate, approximately seven years later, Paul is on his third missionary journey. He is in a place called Ephesus, uh, where he is actually spending three years uh, in Ephesus. Uh, and from there, he's writing to the church in Corinth. Uh, over the last several years, the church has grown, and of course, certain problems have come into the church. And so he's, he has to address those issues. He has to address those problems. So he's writing this letter from Ephesians to the church in Corinth. And as the Holy Spirit is leading him, he's addressing all of these issues that need to be addressed. Uh, so we saw in, in, in the earlier part of this episode, uh, the first issue he addresses is that of unity. Uh, you know, that, 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 that the people in Corinth stay united. Uh, there was a lot of division in the church there because people were taking sides with different leaders. As we saw earlier, some were taking sides with Paul and Apollos Up and Peter and so on. And so he had to, you know, address that with the help of the Holy Spirit. We saw how he did that. And then he addressed, he points to the gospel as the main thing, the message of the cross as, as the main thing that we have received by revelation. Uh, and as Paul continues on, the next issue that he addresses, which we saw last Sunday... Uh, was in chapter 5 where he addresses uh, the issue of sexual sin in the church. And so he addresses, uh, he, uh, he, he, he leads the church and says, this is how you've got to deal with this person uh, who's living in sexual sin. And, and we went through that in chapter 5. So we pick up this morning now in chapter 6. And for our study this morning, I've divided this chapter in just uh, three sections, verses 1 to 8, where he talks about resolving disputes between believers uh, uh, in verses 9 through 11, he reminds them of, the, of what God has done in their lives. We've been washed, sanctified, and justified. And in verses 12 through 20, he teaches us, uh, uh, teaches believers, how to stay away from sexual sin. So really in this chapter, in chapter 6, there are two main things that Paul is addressing. The first is resolving disputes between believers and the second is on how to stay away from sexual sin. So let's go through. Uh, we'll read the first eight verses of 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Uh, please follow along with me in your Bible. I hope you brought your Bibles or use your phone, your Bible on your phone. Uh, or just look into your neighbors and follow along. 1 Corinthians chapter 6 verses 1 through 8. Dare any of you having a matter against another... Go to the law before the unrighteous, and not before the saints. Do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And the world will be judged by you. Are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Do you not know that we shall judge angels? How much more things that pertain to this life? If then you have judgments concerning things pertaining to this life, do you appoint those who are least esteemed by the church to judge? I say this to your shame. Is it so that there is not a wise man among you, not even one, who will be able to judge between his brethren? But brother goes to law against brother, and that before unbelievers. Now therefore it is already an utter failure for you that you go to law against one another. Why do you not rather accept wrong? Why do you not rather let yourselves be cheated? No, you yourselves do wrong and cheat. And you do these things to your brethren. 
So Paul in, is now changing subject. Chapter 5, he's dealt with the issue of, you know, what do you do with this man who's uh, living in uh, willful uh, immoral immorality in the church? How do you handle it? Then he shifts subject and he says, okay, there's another matter I need to address. And it is this. The, uh, believers in Corinth, you guys are, wrong, are cheating each other. You're doing things to each other. And then you're going out to the civil court and you're fighting your matters out in the public. And that's not the way it should be. So just to give us a little background to, you know, the, the, to understand what Paul is saying. Uh, when he talks about judgment and the, and the believers going in to the public for judgment. Uh, in Corinth, in this city, they had what was called as the Bema or the seat of judgment. This was out in the city center or in the marketplace. It was an, ele an elevated stone platform. What you're seeing is our, the actual Bema or the seat of judgment in Corinth. Of course, it's in the ruins now, but this was the actual place. It was an elevated stone platform. The local judge would sit on the platform and the, the, the parties who are having a dispute will also be on this elevated platform fighting it out. And it was actually a form of entertainment for the rest of the people. Because everybody could see it. Everybody could hear what was going on. And uh, this was judgment. Now, incidentally, the apostle Paul himself was dragged to this very place. Uh, when he was in Corinth, spending 18 months there, the last part of that, and you'll read about this in Acts 18, verses 12 to 15, towards the end of his time there in Corinth, uh, there were some Jews who were so opposed to Paul, they dragged him and they took him to this very place. They put him on court with a local judge, Gallio, sitting there. And they began to accuse Paul. He's giving us some new words. He's giving us some new names. And he's contradicting our law. And this judge said, hey, if it is a matter of words and names and your law, you take care of it yourself. <laughs> you know, but if it is an issue of wrongdoing, of uh, you know, some sort of wickedness, then you bring him here. So the judge promptly dismissed the case. And that was it. So Paul is speaking from firsthand experience standing upon the uh, on that, uh, uh, you know, standing in front of that judgment seat. And he's telling you believers, you are taking your disputes out in the open in front of an unbelieving judge. And imagine what shame it's bringing to the name of Jesus Christ. And so he addresses, he says, you know, isn't, first of all, you're standing in front of an unbeliever. Those who are least esteemed by the church, you're putting them to judge you. Secondly, don't, you know, he, remind, he tries to tell them, look, this is what God, the future that God has for us as believers. We have been lifted up to a place that is much greater than angels. We are seated at the right hand of God. And we are going, in time to come, we are going to judge angels. He's also referencing to Daniel chapter 7, where uh, Daniel prophesied that when Jesus, when, when the, the Son of Man receives his kingdom, uh, and the saints will inherit the kingdom, and the saints will help administer the kingdom. So he's saying, look, you and I are actually going to be judging. You, you and I are going to be ruling. We're going to be judging angels. We're going to be uh, ruling with Jesus. So for now, in the matters of this life, isn't there even one wise person who can sit down and help you sort the matter out? Instead of you taking it out into the civil court. So there is a lesson here. But before we actually get down to that point, I just want to address the side issue. Does that mean, you know, Paul is saying we should disregard civil courts and legal authority? Not at all. So people ask the question, you know, what about uh, uh, civil courts? What about legal authority? Well, we don't use this passage to get rid of it. Uh, in, uh, of 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 uh, uh, the the proper place of civil courts. In fact, in uh, in his uh, other writings, in Romans thirteen, uh, verses three to four, Paul says that you know the courts and the people whom God has put in governmental authority, uh, they are actually appointed by God and they should be honored. Uh, Paul, in his own lifetime, you find at least two occasions when he invoked his right as a Roman citizen. 
There's one occasion when uh, uh, he was going to be sentenced without a trial. And he said, no, I'm a Roman citizen. You cannot sentence me without a proper trial. So he invoked his right. Another time he said, I'm a Roman citizen and I can appeal to Caesar. And so he reached out to the highest authority in his day, to a uh, legal authority in his day. And he appealed directly to Caesar. And that's why he was sent off to Rome. So Paul himself invoked legal, uh, the legal system uh, when it was needed for his case. So what he was really addressing is the real issue here is brother against brother. When there is a problem amongst ourselves uh, between brother to brother, how do we resolve it? What should we do? What Paul is basically saying is resolve it internally within the church. Get somebody to sit down. Get somebody to address this problem. And so that's the way you and I should try and work things out. So we must learn to settle things amongst ourselves using the principles of God. The Lord Jesus uh, instructed us in this manner in Matthew 18, verses 15 through 17. This is what Jesus said. He said, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he hears you, you have gained your brother. But if he will not hear, take with you one or two more, that by the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. And if he refuses to hear, tell it to the church. But if he refuses even to hear the church, let him be like to you, be to you like a heathen and a tax collector. So Jesus gave us clear instructions. You try to resolve the matter directly with the person. Uh, if that doesn't work out, take one or two brothers. Uh, take a couple other believers. Try to resolve that. If that still doesn't work out, take it to the church leadership. Uh, and then let them administer what is right. Now, if either party refuses to hear uh, what has been administered by the church, then fine. You're free to treat him as an unbeliever, which means at that point, if you want to, you know, proceed with legal, in, in a legal way, that's entirely up to you. But what Paul is telling us here in Romans uh, chapter 6 and verse 7, he says, why do you not rather accept wrong? Why do you not rather let yourselves be cheated? And so that's something to keep in mind, that for the sake of the honor of the name of Christ, I don't want to take this out, I'd rather suffer wrong, I'd rather be cheated than to bring reproach to the name of Christ. I'm not saying, or Paul is not saying it's wrong to go to the legal, uh, invoke the legal system. What he's saying is try to sort it out internally. If you need to accept wrong, let it go. It's fine. But if, if, he's, if the person is not willing to accept the, what is administered internally by the church, then you treat him as an unbeliever. At that point, you're free to do uh, what you would do, in which case if you want to go to the legal system, that's entirely up to you. Uh, I trust that uh, this will never happen here. Moving on. <laughs> so in verse 8, he says, No, you yourselves do wrong and cheat. You do these things to your brethren. He says, guys, you are doing wrong to one another. You're cheating one another. And so he says, I need to remind you about something. And that's verses 9 through 11. He says, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but you were washed. You were sanctified. But you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. So he wants to remind them. He says, you know, guys, you're fighting, you're cheating each other. But I want to remind you of something. He says, you know, first of all, just keep in mind uh, that if we live like this, and he enumerates a, a list of uh, a sinful lifestyle, and obviously that is not a complete list, but he enumerates a list and he says, you know, uh, if you live like this, I want you to know the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. They have no place in the kingdom of God. And I just want us to you know, take a moment to look at that list. Uh, obviously, this is not a complete list, but look at what he mentioned. He mentions fornicators, the sexual sin, idolaters, worshippers of false gods, of mammon, adulterers, that means any sin, sexual sin that violates the covenant of marriage, uh, homosexuals, uh, sodomites, is this another word, a generic, generic term for all kinds of homosexual practices. He um, talks about thieves, he talks about covetous or being greedy, he talks about drunk drunkards, he talks about revilers, which are people who are abusive, cursing, slandering others, and he talks about extortioners, cheating people, swindling, 
uh, stealing, and so on. So he just, you know, just makes a list of all of these things. Uh, so the point is, you know, not that one sin is worse than the other, but he says if you live in it like this, uh, we cannot inherit the kingdom of God. As a side note, I want to point out something to you and me. You know, twice in this, in this list are mentioned, is mentioned homosexuality. So somebody says, you know, show me in the Bible where it is said homosexuality is sin. So right there. Right there. Look. <laughs> twice. <laughs> okay. Uh, it is mentioned there. Very clear. And it's only one of the many references in Scripture. Where, it, where, where we find it's clearly stated in New Testament Scripture. Where it's clearly stated that homosexuality is sin. Now, you know, some people will say, well, you see, the Bible is old-fashioned. They didn't have all the things that, you know, the modern thinking we have today. We are very liberal in our thinking. Hey, I want you to understand the culture, the time in which Paul was writing. He was not writing in a homophobic culture. In fact, in his day, things were as, e as bad or maybe even worse than our times. In his day, out of the 15 Roman emperors, 14 of them were homosexual or bisexual. The emperor. So this was common. This was the way they lived. All right? And in his day, in the place where he was living, Corinth, and we will, that's the reason he's addressing all of this. In Corinth itself, uh, as we mentioned the very first message in the, in the, in the introduction, Corinth. At the center of the city at Acro Corinth, the high place in Corinth, was dedicated to the Greek goddess of love. Where it was said that in her temple, there were a thousand male and female prostitutes. People living in open sin. Corinth was known for its perversion. It was known like this. So he's, he's not writing in, you know, a, an old mindset. No, he was, he was living in a society that was, a, that was as depraved, if not more depraved than our society. And in that midst, he was there, it was clear, and he made a clear-cut statement that these kinds of things, homosexuality, sodomites, will not inherit the kingdom of God. Very clear. So it was an old-fashioned statement. Are you understanding? So it's, just, it's the same as our society. And he was very clear in what he said. Uh, having said that, um, you know, he also mentions these other kinds of sins like stealing, being covetous, uh, of uh, being slanderous and extortionous. I mean, other sins as well uh, aside from the sexual sins. But verse 11. So he reminds them of all this. Look, you know, this is, this is the kind of life that's there at Corinth. But he says, verse 11, such were some of you. This was your past. But you have been washed, you have been sanctified, and you have been justified. In the name of our Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. What a powerful thing says, look, Corinthians, that was your past. It's gone. You are washed. Uh, literally meaning you're, you're completely washed. The Bible tells us that the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us from all sin. Washes us clean. Removes all the dirt, the stain. Says you have been washed. And then he says you've been sanctified. That means you've been now made holy. You're consecrated to God. You are now holy unto God. You, you know, can you imagine living in that filth. And now you've been brought out. You've been made completely clean. And now what was once, once filthy, depraved, sinful, corrupt. Today is holy. It's consecrated. It's set apart for God. He says that's who you are. And he says, you are justified. To be made justified means you're righteous. That means there is no condemnation, no guilt, no shame, no judgment over your life. Amen? And that's who each one of us 
is uh, in Jesus Christ, having believed in Jesus, this is who we are. So let's boldly declare this together. Say this loudly with me. I am washed, sanctified, and justified in the name of our Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of God. Amen. That's beautiful. That's wonderful news. That's who we are. So, you know, it doesn't matter what your past was. We all have a past. But, you know, you are washed. You are sanctified. You are justified. See yourself the way you are today in Jesus Christ. Amen. Don't let the devil cause you to dwell in your past. God even doesn't consider it. He sees you as a person who's been washed, who be, who's been sanctified, who's been justified in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, if God did it then, do you think he can do it again today? Yes or no? Yeah. So when you see people who are living in that kind of a situation, when you see somebody bound in homosexuality or any kind of sexual sin or any other kind of... Uh, 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 immoral, wrong kind of lifestyle, you look at them with eyes of hope. Look at them saying, my God, in the name of Jesus, this man, this woman can be washed, sanctified and justified. That's how you and I should see them. Amen? Not like, oh man, that's it. This is the end of your, your life. No, no, no. Look at them with the eyes of hope. Look at them saying, my God can do it in that person's life. My God can take them out of that and make them washed, sanctified, justified, just like he did it for me and for you. Amen? So while we're not denying that dirt and filth, we look at them with eyes of hope. We look at them uh, with what God can do in their lives. So having reminded them, you know, this was your past. Now, verses 12 to 20 is, is the challenging part. How do you teach believers who've come out of such depravity, who, uh, who maybe they understand that they've been washed, sanctified, and justified. How do you teach them now to stay free from sexual sin? How do you make sure they don't go back and live in that kind of a lifestyle? What truths can you bring to them so that they can live godly, righteous lives? And that is so important for you and me today. Because we too are living in a world that is corrupt and has all kinds of things. But for you and me, how do, what, what truth is the Holy Spirit going to tell us so we could live uh, uh, pure over sexual sin? So let's go through this, uh, verses 12 to 20. Well, let's read the whole passage and then we look at it verse by verse. Verse 12. All things are lawful for me, but all things are not helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Foods for the stomach and the stomach for foods. But God would destroy both it and them. That is both the stomach and the food. Now the body is not for sexual immorality, but for the Lord. And the Lord for the body. And God both raised up the Lord and will also raise us up by his power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and then make them members of a harlot, that's a prostitute? Certainly not. Or do you not know that he was joined to a prostitute or a harlot is one body with her? For the two, he says, shall become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. Flee sexual immorality. Every sin that a man does is outside the body, but he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? For you were bought at a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. In this passage, we find God's truth. To enable you and me to live free from sexual sin. So let's go through this passage. And I, and I just trust that these truths that we talk about will really empower us, will really strengthen us to live victorious in this area. Verse 12. 
all things are lawful for me, all things are not helpful, all things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. So Paul is beginning to, uh, so in the context here, he's beginning to address, obviously, sexual sin, but he begins with a very general statement. He says, look, you know, there are many things that may be lawful, uh, that may be acceptable, but two things, it's not beneficial, and second, I will not be brought under the control of anything. Amen? So it's not, it's, the, the real issue is, is not, is it okay? The real issue is, is it beneficial and is it going to control me? Now, putting this in context, he's addressing sexual sin, specifically going to the prostitute. In Corinthian culture at that time, it was just normal. It was acceptable for you to go to a prostitute. It's normal. It's acceptable. But here he's beginning to address that issue. He says, look, it may be acceptable, it may be okay, but two things. It's not beneficial, and he's going to tell us why. And two, I don't want to be brought under the control of anything. And I want to present this to you and me. Just because something is okay culturally or something is okay contextually. Because now people argue, this culture is not okay, that culture is okay. So let's go one more level down, contextually. Even if something is acceptable contextually, doesn't mean it's beneficial and doesn't mean you need to be brought under its control. Example. Many examples. <laughs> you know, maybe drinking, alcohol. Man, when you're in Ireland, they drink over lunch. It's like you drinking Coca-Cola, they drink. Contextually, it's nothing. It's nothing. It's just. So just because you're there and that contextually that is acceptable doesn't mean it's beneficial and doesn't mean you need to be brought under its control. You can say amen or you can say, oh, me, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> so, you know, things can change culturally or even contextually. But the, pre the point Paul is saying is this, look, you've got to ask the question, is it beneficial? Is it going to end up controlling me? Right. So having said that, he says in the next verse, verse 13 and 14, foods for the stomach and the stomach for foods. God will destroy both it and them. Now the body is not for sexual immorality, but for the Lord, the Lord for the body, and God uh, uh, both raised up the Lord. He will also raise us up by his power. So he says, look, God has created our body, and I'm just paraphrasing it. God has created our body, and our body has appetites. So God created our stomach. The stomach needs food. God not only created the stomach, he also created the food for the stomach. So both are legitimate. Your stomach and the food for the stomach. Legitimate. Similarly, God has created our sexual appetite. Yeah, God created it. And he's also created a legitimate way in which we meet that sexual appetite is fulfilled. God designed both. Both the appetite and the means to satisfy it. Are you with me? But he's saying, you know, a time will come and God will destroy both. That means your body no longer, your stomach is no longer need, going to have, have a need for foods. And there's going to be no need for foods to satisfy the stomach. That is going to go. With our glorified bodies. And the similarly, the appetite, sexual appetite will one be gone. The need and the means to satisfy it, gone. But now, while we're here on the earth, when we satisfy the legitimate appetites of our body, which God gave to us, we have to do it also in legitimate ways. And that's why he says, the body is not, verse 13, second part, the body is not for sexual 
immorality. Your body's got sexual appetite, but you don't satisfy that appetite by an illegitimate way, which is immor immoral way. Are you with me so far? Right? So he says, you don't do that, but what must we understand? We must understand that the body is for the Lord. That means all my appetites are consecrated to the Lord. Let's say this. It's not on your screen, but let's say it. Say this to me. All my appetites are consecrated to God. You don't sound very convinced, but anyway. Uh, the body is for the Lord. Let's say the body is for the Lord. So that's what Paul is saying. The body is not for sexual immorality, but it's for the Lord. So this is the first truth that Paul begins to bring out for us as a, as a way for us to live free from sexual sin. Understand that your body is for the Lord. Affirm that over your body over and over again, which means my appetites remain consecrated to God. And as I satisfy the appetites of my body, I do it in a way, in, in ways that honor God, not in ways that dishonor God. The body is for the Lord. Amen? And then he says, the Lord is for the body. Think about that a minute. The Lord is for your body. He points to the future, of course, in verse 14, saying one day God's going to raise up our body just the way he raised up Jesus. That is true. It's the future. It will happen. The Lord's for the body. But the Lord is for the body even now. So let's say this together. The Lord is for my body. What does that mean now? Who is the Lord? He is your healer. So the healer is for my body. Who is the Lord? He's my strengthener. He's my life. He is for my body. So let's say this together. First of all, my body is not for sexual sin. My body is for the Lord. And the Lord for my body. Let's say this together. The Lord is for my body. The Lord is healer. His healing is for my body. The Lord is strengthener. His strength is for my body. Do you get that? The Lord is for the body. Your body is for the Lord. So the first truth that's going to help you and me stay from, away from sexual sin. First, my body is for the Lord. You declare that over yourself. All my appetites are consecrated to the Lord. The, my body is for the Lord. Verse 15. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them members of a harlot, of a prostitute? Certainly no. So next truth he's saying. Guys, I want you to understand. Your body are, uh, is a member of the body of Christ. Member means a limb, a, a physical part of the body of Christ. Now that's something to think about. He's saying... He's not talking about your spirits. He's saying your body. So pinch yourself. <laughs> My body. <laughs> he says your body is a part of the body of Christ. Now when we say we are part of the body of Christ, you know, we understand that in a mystical sense, in a spiritual sense. Yeah, true. Spiritually, I'm part of the body of Christ. True. But now he's talking about your body. The Greek is soma. That means there's no doubt. It's your, your physical body. Your soma, your body is a part of the body of Christ. He's going to tell us a little later how that connection comes. But for now, just accept the truth. Your body is part of the body of Christ. It's connected to Jesus. It is his, that means through this body, Jesus is expressed and revealed. This body is connected to Jesus. So he's saying... How can I then take this body and make it part of a prostitute? It means how can I let this body engage in a sexual impurity? How can I let it be a part of that? Because he says, continuing on, okay, let's, just, uh, let's emphasize this point here. Let's say this together. My body is part of the body of Christ. So the second truth that will help us. You see your body as a part of the body of Christ. 
and he explained in the next two words how it is. But this body is a part of the body of Christ. I mean, Jesus Christ is going to be revealed through this body. Then he continues, verse 16 and 17. Do you not know that he was joined to a harlot, that's a prostitute, is one body with her? For the two he says shall become one flesh. But he was joined to the Lord, is one spirit. Now why is he saying that when, uh, uh, even if a believer uh, lies, uh, sleeps with a prostitute, what you're doing is you're taking the believer's body, which is supposed to be part of the body of Christ, you're now making it part of a prostitute's body. He says you can't do that. It should not happen. Because he says in verse 16, you know, uh, don't you know that, you know, uh, when, when there is a, a sexual relationship, you be, the two become one. So if a believer's body is being sexually related to a prostitute's body, that should not happen. So let's say this, uh, let's understand this. In sexual relationship outside of marriage, when two become one flesh, this joining is something that happens in sin and it is under God's judgment. How can we say that? Hebrews 13 verse 4. Marriage is honorable. Uh, that means marriage is a very precious, valuable thing. It's a great price among all. Uh, the bed, that is the marriage bed, is undefiled. That is pure. But fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. That means when you violate this, fornicators uh, uh, or adulterers, whether you're violating the marriage bed outside of marriage or in the marriage and you're having a relationship outside, God will judge. So sexual relationship outside of marriage is in sin, comes under God's judgment. Whereas, if you put it the positive way, sexual relationship within marriage, the two becoming one flesh is pure and is under God's blessing. Is it clear? You see, I, this has to be so clear in our, our culture, in our thinking, because in our culture, you know, it's, it's so common. Or we're just living together. It's acceptable. Well, all things, many things are acceptable. But it's not, doesn't make beneficial. You don't want to be brought under the power of sin. Or you have the celebrities. He's my partner. She's my partner. They even have children of their partners. But not legally married. It's acceptable. But the Bible is very clear. Fornicators, adulterers, God will judge. Meaning that is not holy before God. Are you listening? For those who are listening can say amen. Others are still pondering. It's okay. <laughs> All right. Verse 17. But he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit. So now he's saying, look, as a believer... You're joined to the Lord. You're spiritually one with Him. Now because you are spiritually one with Him, you're living in a body. So your body now is considered part of the body of Christ. He who is joined to the Lord is spiritually one with Him. You've become one with the Lord. And so He just said, look, you can't take... Your body, which is a member of the body of Christ, and make it one with the prostitute because you are spiritually one with the Lord. You're one with Jesus. So now your body also has to be treated and looked at it from that perspective. The ramifications of being spiritually one with the Lord is just so great. Uh, it it's just opens up a completely different area to know that uh, you are in Christ and Christ is in you. It's an amazing, powerful truth. Uh, but we need to live out of that. We need to understand who we are in Jesus Christ and uh, because of our spiritual union. But in this context, he's really talking about uh, uh, treating our body in, that, uh, in view of that. Let's declare this. I'm spiritually one with Jesus. I'm in him. He's in me. My spiritual identity is in him. He's in me. His life is in me. He works through me. You know, we are spiritually one with Jesus. So, verse 18. Flee sexual immorality. 
Every sin that a man does is outside the body, but he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. Flee. The word flee means to run away. It means to vanish. It means to escape. It literally means to seek, seek safety by flight. Meaning literally fly away quickly. So what Paul is saying is, look, I've said all this. Your body is for the Lord. Your body is a member of Christ. You are spiritually one with Jesus. In the light of all that I've said, your only response to immorality is for you to run from it. So in view of the truth that we are joined to the Lord and all of this that he shared, our only response to all forms of sexual sin is to flee. So here's a very important secret. When you think, when you have even the slightest inkling that a temptation to sexual sin is about to present itself, don't stop to think, ponder, meditate, pray about it, please. Run first, think later. <laughs> Did he get it? Run first. Think. <laughs> because by the time you've thought through on that, you're already halfway in. So what Paul is saying is flee sexual immorality. Flee, run. Run from it. The moment it's, you know it's about to present itself. Hey, get out of that place. Get out of it. Don't hang. Don't stay there. Run from it. Flee. Because he says, every sin that we do, you know, normally the wrong that we do, it's all external. But when you commit sexual immorality, now we're talking about any form of sexual sin. So although the, the context here primarily is prost visiting prostitutes, uh, uh, the, the word that he uses, pornea, uh, it just has, it's an all-inclusive word. When, he used, when, we, when we translate in English sexual immorality, he's using the Greek word pornea, which simply means all kinds of sexual impurity. So he's saying here, he who commits pornea, sexual immorality, is sinning against his own body. Think about that. Sexual sin has a way of affecting and violating our body in moral and spiritual ways. It affects us. You look at Proverbs, in Proverbs 5.22, we see it is enslaving. Proverbs 6.26-32, it's destructive. First Peter 2.11, it's troubling. So this thing is going to enslave, it's going to destroy, it's going to trouble. So keep in mind that sex outside of marriage, it might appear exciting, but it's never enriching. It is only enslaving, destructive, troubling. So let's say this together. I turn away. I run in terror from all sexual sin. So run from it. Stay away. So if YouTube is so generous to bring up an ad... That's going to take you off. Hey. Shut it down. Click. Don't think, should I pray about this one? <laughs> That's not something to pray about. Get off. Now, you may have gone to watch Pastor Ashes on YouTube. <laughs> Midway through the sermon, YouTube serves up another ad. <laughs> Don't pray about it. If it is not righteous, if it's not a good thing. Hey, get it off. Keep listening to the pastor. Because <laughs> you don't know when, where, how these things present themselves to us today. Our only response is flee. Get it out. Quick. Run from it. Paul says flee sexual immorality. And then last two verses. Verses 19 and 20. He says, again, he brings out two more truths. Why we should stay away from sexual sin. Verse 19. Or do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, 
whom you have from God and you are not your own. For you were bought at a price, therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God. So he's saying, Corinthians, don't you know that your body is the temple of God? Because the Holy Spirit of God is in you. And he's awakening them to this truth. Hey, your body is God's temple. Now they understand the concept of temple. And he's saying, your body is temple, God's temple. It's holy place. Don't desecrate it. Don't violate it. Keep it clean. Uh, because God is dwelling in you by his spirit. And secondly, he says, you've been bought with a price. I mean, say, Corinthians, believers, your body is not even yours. You've been bought. Your body now belongs to the Lord. So glorify God in your body, spirit, soul, and body belongs to God. So let's make these two affirmations and get ready to close. He said, let's say this is there. My body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. It's a dwelling place of God. My body is holy. Let's also say this. My body is not mine. My spirit, soul, and body have been bought with the blood of Jesus. And they belong to God. So see, in this whole passage, verses 12 to 20, Paul is presenting truth to these believers who've come out of a very depraved background and who are actually living in the middle of a society. And he's saying, look, live by these truths. And that's how for you and me as believers today, we have to live by these truths. Right? We can't let the world around us control us. No. We live by the truth of the word of God. Amen. <clears throat> well, let's quickly remind us of these six statements here. What has he said? First, my body is not for sexual sin. My body is for the Lord. Second, my body is part of the body of Christ. So you see that. Third, I am spiritually one with Jesus. He's in me, I'm in him. So I'm connected to him. My life, my strength flows from him. Fourth, run away from all sexual sin. Run away from it. Five, my body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. It's a dwelling place of God. My body is holy. And six, he says, my body is not mine. My spirit, soul, and body been bought with the blood of Jesus and they belong to God. So this morning, we want to take some time to pray. I don't want us to, you know, come under condemnation or feel like, man, uh, I'm in a bad state this morning. I should not have come to church, you know. No. no. Listen. Doesn't matter what you've done till now. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, by the Spirit of our God, like we saw, we can be washed, sanctified, and justified. That's the beautiful thing. That's what Jesus does for us. He washes us, sanctifies us, and he justifies us. So there is no condemnation. But the invitation this morning is, as Paul put it out to the Corinthians, hey, you and I, we can live uh, free from sexual sin. If we just consecrate all our appetites, our God-given appetites, consecrate it to the Lord. Consecrate it to Him. We can live free from that. So I want us to just rise to our feet, please. Um, we're going to take some time to pray. Call our worship team up, please. I want to give you just some time, just between you and God, you know in what area of your life you need to just consecrate to God this morning. You know it. It may not be the area of sexuality. It may be some other appetite in your body. Thank God for food. But if our appetite for food goes uncontrolled, it could, again, cause some damage. <laughs> or some other appetite that we have. Whatever it is, this morning, as you're here, as you're standing here in the presence of God, this is time between you and the Lord. I want you to consecrate it. Say, God, my body is for the Lord. 
It means all my appetites of you. I want to consecrate it that way. I want to keep it holy. Never mind what's happened in the past, Lord. This morning you wash, sanctify, justify. I'm washed, sanctified, justified. I embrace that truth. And Lord, I consecrate my body. I consecrate it to the Lord. I want every person here, just look to the Lord Jesus. Look to him. And in your own way, in whatever area of your life, you need to consecrate to God. Do it. So Lord, my body is yours. This body is the temple of the Holy Spirit. This body is part of the body of Christ. Because spiritually I'm one with him. Spiritually you're one with him as a believer. And your body has been purchased. With a great price. With the very blood of Jesus Christ. So, Father, as we stand here this morning in your presence, we welcome the work of the Holy Spirit. We welcome the work of the Spirit. Touching every heart, touching every life, God. I pray, Father, if there are people who are bound in any way, where their appetites have come under the power of something. This morning, set each one free. This morning, set each one free. That our bodies will be consecrated to you. Our appetites be consecrated to you. Do this, Father, we pray. Touching every heart, I worship you, I worship you, you are here, healing every heart, I worship Turning lives around I worship 
And declare over your people, where us as your people, that we are a people who are consecrated to the Lord. And we are a holy temple unto God. That Lord, each one of us, our whole spirit, soul, and body is consecrated to the Lord. And by the power of your Holy Spirit and in the authority of Jesus' name, I declare our bodies are holy. All our appetites are consecrated to God. Set apart are holy to God. And from this day on, from this moment on, the body is for the Lord and the Lord is for the body. The Lord will be glorified in each of our lives. We glorify God in our body because we've been bought with a price. Lord, I pray that our bodies are kept as holy vessels to you. Anointed vessels. Consecrated vessels through which Jesus Christ is glorified. Thank you, O oh God. Thank you, Lord Jesus. And Lord, we heard in your word that the Lord is for the body. So I pray over people right now. You are for the body. The Lord is for the body. The healer, Jehovah Rapha, is for the body. Lord, I pray because you are for the body. Release your healing people's bodies but God those who need your healing to flood their bodies nothing is impossible for you nothing nothing so whatever healing is needed Lord let your healing touch our bodies let your healing touch our bodies because the Lord is for the body. The Lord is for your body. In the name of Jesus, receive your healing. Receive your healing. Let the healing virtue of God flow through your body because the Lord is for your body. The Lord is for your body. Receive your healing. Receive your healing. Receive your wholeness. Thank you, Lord. We bless your name. We bless your name. Thank you. Before we close, I just want to give an invitation for anyone here this morning. If you've never received Jesus into your life, maybe you're visiting, maybe you've come here, but you never received Jesus into your heart. You don't know that your sins are forgiven, that you're a new person. The Bible says, as we heard this, this morning, the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, cleanses us from all sin. The Bible tells us if anyone comes into Christ, he becomes a new person. So if you've never experienced that, you've never received Jesus, I want to take a moment just to pray with you before we dismiss, give you an opportunity to receive Jesus into your life. Just pray this prayer with me if you've never done this before. Just say this with me, Lord Jesus, I receive you into my life. Forgive my sins. I believe you died and you rose again. Be the Lord of my life. And help me follow you and you alone the rest of my life. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Anybody, you pray this prayer with me for the very first time. I just want to see your hands. We want to celebrate with you. 
So if you prayed with me this morning, right now, for the first time, just raise your hand. I just want to see that. Anyone up in the balcony? Anyone? Are there any hands here? Okay. I don't see any hand. If you did pray that prayer, on all our exits, there'll be our greeters with a green back. So just let them know, I did pray the prayer. We want to give that back to you. That bag is a free gift from us to you. It has resources that will help you grow in your faith in Christ. So make sure you get that bag before you leave. Let's close, please. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, our Heavenly Father, and the sweet fellowship of His Holy Spirit be with each of us always. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for listening. We trust this message was a blessing to you. For more free resources, including sermons, sermon notes, TV programs, publications, please visit apcwo.org. For information on APC Bible College in Bangalore, please visit apcwo.org slash Bible College. Please remember to download the All People's Church Bangalore app from the app or Google Play stores.